Would you open your Bibles, please, to Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Daniel chapter 11, as you know, is one of the most detailed passages in the Scripture that contains prophecy in detail. Lots and lots of prophecy. As a matter of fact, there are 135, you could say approximately, some could be questioned or there could be more, prophecies that are very, very specific in this chapter. And we've been talking through them over the last two weeks. It's been a mountain of historical information. And yet, it's not so that we can say, let's talk about history in our sermon. What a waste. But history, when the Bible talks about events, is the backdrop of what's going on. And when it's prophetic, wow, God is saying future history is going to tell you about even a further future. Something that will happen even later on. Now that might be confusing to us, but this is what's going on in Daniel. Daniel, by way of recap here, now is very old. He's under the reign of Cyrus at this point. And Daniel is hearing from God through either Jesus, an Old Testament appearance of him, or an angel that actually kind of looks like him. We're not exactly sure. But either way, it's the Lord speaking to Daniel. It was written down. That's the Lord speaking to us. That's the Lord especially speaking to God's people, the Jews, who Daniel is most concerned about. He was brought over many years before, decades before, in the exile where Nebuchadnezzar II actually is who he is, in case you're wondering. He comes in and he conquers Jerusalem and he deports all the people out of Jerusalem and brings them into his own land, not so much as slaves, but as very, very, um, shall we say, bound subjects that are there to perform whatever he wants them to do. And they set up shop and they live their lives there. But that's not where they're supposed to be. Because God said it'll be 70 years and then you're going back. And now 70 years have come and gone. And now the people are starting to go back under Ezra. You want to know about that? Read the book of? Ah, uh, yeah. Read the book of Ezra. There it is. So they're going back. However, Daniel is staying in Babylon. And when he hears these prophecies, you're hearing now about what is going to happen back in the land. Daniel's not going back, maybe for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that he's probably at least 85 years old when he's writing this down. So he's not a young man. Making a journey like that is not an easy journey. It's hundreds and hundreds of miles over terrain without freeways. So it's long. But Daniel writes these things down. Because God is telling him to tell the Israelites, the scroll will get to them, that you are going to endure some terrible times. Times that you're going to wonder, is God really God? Did God, who made the covenant with us, forget his covenant? Is uh, all that we're going through, have we, have we done wrong again? Is God punishing us? Now, we could ask those questions, because in the moment, today, many of you in this room, no doubt, are probably got up this morning and probably wondered if God was punishing you for something. You know, if not physical maladies or problems in your family, maybe the coffee machine didn't work. I don't know. But you're wondering, what's God doing? These people had to know what God was doing over a period of hundreds of years because they are going to endure they're going to endure persecution. They're going to endure oppression. They're going to endure political intrigue, which they can't do anything about. And it's going to be back and forth and back and forth as we've been reading about all these people in this map that you see here. You've got the purple area at the bottom. You have sort of that golden area, yellowish area, uh, that's massive in the middle there. All the purple areas there are the, under the generals at which became kings that go by the name of the Ptolemies, spelled with a P, P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, Ptolemies. And what's the deal with that? Well, they're in here. They're the king to the south. 
the army to the south. And as you read Daniel chapter 11, which I'm not going to go back and read the whole thing, wow, your head will explode. But the army to the south attacks the armies, the king to the north, and the king to the north. They're the Seleucids, and they're under the Antiochus or Seleucid kings. And there's, you know, Seleucus the first and Seleucus and all these guys. And then you have uh, Antiochus the first, second, third. And we left off last week with this incredible villain, Antiochus the fourth, also known as Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. And he's so important. We've already run into him in an earlier chapter in Daniel where he was detailed out what he was going to do. We've run into him prophetically, where he was described as a little horn, or a, you, know, you know, what have you, uh, as a man of intrigue, and, and just wicked and evil and controlled by Satan. And yet Antiochus Epiphanes came and went, and Daniel prophesied about him. And that was what we did last week. And he comes to power finally and really causes some horrendous, horrendous problems for the Jews. So much so that the temple is defiled, defiled by a pig being slaughtered on its altar by the priests who are being forced to drink pig's blood. Pig's blood painted all around the walls of the temple, including the Holy of Holies. It was vile. It was what was called by God an abomination. If you don't know what abomination means, by the way, it's a strong word, and I know you know that, but it literally defines as something utterly disgusting. And God finds it something not just bad, but utterly disgusting. That's how he describes what Antiochus Epiphanes did to the temple and the people in Israel when he swept through that land as we described in detail last week. Now, here in this prophetic chapter, God is giving us not just information. He's giving us information that will result in transformation. How many of you have ever gone to a history class in college? Don't raise your hands. I mean, you know, high school and whatever, and you go, I'm not transformed by this. I mean, just, you know, somebody give me a glass of water. It's dry, it's dull. But the information that's being given here is transforming to the people. Because if God didn't tell them, now I have a plan. It involves really terrible things happening to you for generations. If these things happened without God telling you that they were going to happen, how would you feel about it? How would you feel about God? You wouldn't even know what's going on. And God tells Daniel, and now he tells us, so here's what's going to happen. All of this back and forth. The king of the north attacks the king of the south. King of the south, king of the north. They marry this daughter and there's intrigue and there's betrayal and everything else. And, and, and I mean, it just goes on and on. You read it. You were here. But within all of that, at least the people know what's coming. And they're going to have to endure through their great, 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 great grandchildren. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't sound good. But when God says, but I'm telling you this is going to happen, he's also telling you, us, them, I'm in charge of history. This is the way it's going to go, and I have told you in advance, because my covenant with you, my people, is an everlasting covenant. I have not betrayed it. I have not betrayed you. Our suffering here nationally in America is a blip compared to what they're going through. Now, we don't have specific prophecies in the Bible about America. You might think there might be some in there, but we can't prove them one way or the other. It's possible. I don't know how likely it is. But the truth is that the whole world in the end times is going to be taking a direction that's now something that Daniel is going to tell us about. Because God told Daniel, it's something concerning the times of the end. This person, Antiochus Epiphanes, that we mentioned, this king of the Seleucids, who attacked the Ptolemies in the south and lost horribly, thinking he was going to win gloriously, because the Ptolemies had called upon this rising little empire to the west called Rome, and suddenly Antiochus Epiphanes is overwhelmed, 
In the meantime, the Jews up in Jerusalem, in that little land that they're crossing back and forth right here on the map, right up against the Mediterranean Sea at the far eastern edge of it, that's Israel, and it's a little narrow land bridge that those people who were supposed to have his back have now sided with his enemies. Now, they don't have any force to do anything really major bad except to be in support of the Ptolemies. But Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a Seleucid, he holds a grudge in a spectacular way. And that's when he goes in and defiles the temple and tries to ruin the Jewish people. And they fight back and they win. That's known as the Maccabean Revolt. And most of you have heard about that. If you haven't, well, get on Wikipedia and read up about it. But there it is. But then we find from this passage, especially starting in verse 36, that as you read on, the context is identified a little bit later on. That Antiochus Epiphanes, who to Daniel and to the Israelites who received Daniel's scroll, would run into hundreds of years in the future, was only a shadow of someone that God's people, the Jews, we're going to run into thousands of years in the future. Interesting how God layers on the prophecies. We get to look at tomorrow's news today. This is the Antichrist's endgame described here at the end of the book of Daniel. Now, there are a lot of things in this passage that we're not sure about. Well, did God miss the mark? No. But there are some things that are stated that when they occur or when they start to occur, you go, aha, that's what that is. Those of you that know me when I teach Bible prophecy know that I don't like doing this is that. Because the next time I teach that same passage of Scripture, this and that changes. Because the world changes. Politics change. Uh, technology changes. This is that doesn't help us out. All it does is it calls into question the credibility of the teacher because he gets it wrong every year because he's got to change it every year. And I don't like doing that. So we're going to be very careful about how we teach this. But in verse 36, actually backing up to verse 35, God qualifies all these prophecies that he said that some of the wise will stumble and so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until... Here it is, the time of the end. What's going to happen with all these prophecies, these people going back and forth, kings fighting back and forth? Some people are going to definitely lose their faith. They're going to say, I've had enough of this. My, my, my parents, my grandparents went through all of this, and now I'm going through it, and there seems no end to it. And what is God doing? Well, if this is the way God is, I'm not going to follow him anymore. In Israel today, 80 to 85 percent of the population of modern Israel is atheist. And yet they're Jewish, and many of them still do their traditions because it's their traditional ethnicity. But if you were to ask them, well, you're a Jew, you're God's covenanted people, why are you an atheist? And the answer is a general statement that says, after Auschwitz, there is no God. It's a profound statement. It's a valid question. How could God let his people go through this? But when you look at Daniel, especially Daniel chapter 11, how could God let his people go through this? And God acknowledges it, that some will stumble. Why? Why is he going to bring this, these horrors on his own people, on the world for that matter? So that they may be refined. That means made solid, made purer, like you refine gold. Remember, you, if any of you ever worked in you know, refining gold or silver for jewelry or something, I had a course in that one time in college, and you had to put this, this stuff in the gold or the, or the silver to, it, that actually caused the dross of the impurities in the fire to come to the surface so they could be scooped off so what you had was pure. They knew the process back then. This is what they did, refined refining, as it were, grain, uh, get, you know, flour, getting the fine flour, putting it through a sieve so that it's better than it ever was. It's more pure. It's more solid than it ever was. And 
they, some may stumble so that they may be refined, purified, made spotless. There's moral spotlessness, the sin, until the time of the end. The time of the end was not when Jesus came the first time. The time of the end is when the Messiah, Jesus, comes the second time. This, of course, has also stumbled the Jewish people enormously. Who There are a lot of Jews that are messianic. Yeah, Jesus came the first time and he's coming back. Yes, I believe in it. That's right. Some of you here are that way. Your, your Jewish ethnicity is there. Boy, I envy you. Because now you recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Fantastic. But that the appointed time is when the Messiah returns. And the Bible indicates in the Old Testament that the Messiah will come a first time and return a second time. Not the least of which is Daniel chapter 9. As we spent time there at the end of the chapter. It's right there. But the appointed time. So God says there is an appointed time and an end time for this. And he begins to elaborate now on Antiochus Epiphanes as a shadow of someone else who is really going to put God's people through a fire that they have never gone through before. It exceeds the Holocaust. Is it a Holocaust? Not quite the same thing. But the persecution makes Hitler look like a mouse. Verse 36. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the God of gods, the, you know, God. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. Well, that's not during Israel's older history. That's in the future. The time of wrath is coming. For what has been determined must take place. Every once in a while, you hear of Christians, churches, groups of people that are Christians that are trying to speed up the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Peter talks about, about speeding his coming, or Paul, rather. But, um, uh, you know, it's a different context. It's a whole different type of thing. I can't make Jesus come any faster, neither can you. We can't. God has that all figured out. It's his timetable. It's his time. And it must, it must, it must take place. What we're breaking into right here, starting in verse 36, is the prophetic history, part of it, of the 70th week of Daniel, the last seven years of Earth's history, which is detailed out like no place else in Revelation, the whole book. And now we're no longer looking into past history. We're looking into the future. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. And he will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. I'm going to read some passages of scripture here. And it frames up everything. You've read them before too. You can turn there if you want or you can just listen to me. But don't you dare fall asleep. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, if you just turn back a few pages, one of the early prophecies that we have in this whole section, when Daniel starts really prophesying in earnest in chapter 7, verse 7, he says this, After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast. If you're not up to speed on this, you've got to read the rest of the chapter. We, for time's sake, we're not. We're just going to deal with the fourth of four beasts that are these in this terrifying beasts in this vision that tell him about empires that are coming up. The fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth, and it crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Remember, ten is a symbol. Horns is a symbol of power or kingliness. We've showed you pictures of how that's portrayed in ancient statues. You know, it's portrayed very obviously if you know what you're looking at. It's very simple. But ten is the number of man's government. This is something that is not of God when used in a symbolic sense. Twelve is 
God's government, 12 tribes, 12 apostles, 144,000 multiples of 12, all of that sort of thing. So, uh, but this is 10. So he's got these 10 horns, the 10 horned beast. Verse 8, while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. The horn had eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Back to verse 36, again in chapter 11. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and say unheard of things against the god of gods. Okay, these prophecies do this. They just dovetail right in with each other. That's the way God works. These things aren't random. God knows the end from the beginning. And he's saying, don't just look at the individual prophecies. I've given you the privilege of seeing the whole thing. Look at the whole picture. Snap on that wide-angle lens on your camera and take a look at it. A chapter 9. We were in chapter 9. Look at verse 26 in chapter 9. Just turn to the right, just a, a couple pages. Chapter 9, verse 26. After 62 sevens, remember those sevens are a series of seven years. 62 groups of seven years. We call those a heptad. In our culture, we call it a decade, ten years. They measured time not in ten-year periods of time, decades, but in seven-year periods of time. Well, after 62 sevens, this is part of Daniel's prophecy. Go back and listen to it or see it on YouTube. The anointed one, the Messiah, will be cut off and have nothing. He will come, the Messiah... He will be killed, cut off. It doesn't mean he will lapse into history. He will be cut off. And he will not take the kingdom. He will not take the majesty of being king at that time. This is what the Jews want. They want the Messiah to come. Rule in Jerusalem from the throne of David with a rod of iron, crowned with many crowns. That day is coming. But when Jesus came... He didn't come to do that, which confused the daylights out of his disciples until the day of Pentecost. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit comes and everything clicks. They get it. They realize he went away like a bridegroom. He's going to come back like a bridegroom coming for a bride. This is what he's going to do. He's coming back. And when he does come back to physically return to the earth, he's coming back to do what they had presumed upon the whole time he was with them. But he didn't deliver because he got cut off. But eventually he's going to rule and reign. After 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. The people of the ruler to come, the ruler who will come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Whoa. The ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Right there, you know there's going to be another temple. There isn't one today. It's coming. But will destroy the city and the ruler to who will come? Who's that? Well, Daniel doesn't really know that right now. But he does know when he's told years later this prophecy here in chapter 11 that we're embarking on now. The end, the end, the end. So we're talking about the end of the world as we know it. Will come like a flood. It's going to come like, like a... They, in Israel, they have flash floods. They're mountainous, you know. So, and they have these things called wadis. They're you know, gullies but they're big. And when it rains up on the ridge and you happen to be down in the Dead Sea region, get away from the gullies fast because you can't see the clouds. You can't hear the thunder. And when it's raining up there, it suddenly fills these gullies with what would be called a true gully washer, unlike anything we've ever seen here. You can go once again to YouTube and you can look up Wadi floods, just floods and wadis, W-A-D-I is what they call them. It's unbelievable the way the water gushes through it. This is what comes to mind. It's going to come like a flash flood of monumental size. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. There's going to be war. Desolations have been decreed. And he, this, this ruler of the world will confirm a covenant. He makes what everybody thinks is an unbreakable perfect deal with many, all the nations of the world, including Israel, for one group of seven years or for seven years. And in the middle of that seven, three and a half years in, he will put an end to sacrifice. The covenant, 
the Jews can rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount. As I've showed you recently as we've been going through these passages of Scripture, just how much closer we're getting to the possibility of that happening. Today, they're talking about it. Ten years ago, you never mentioned it. You'd start World War III. Now, it's up for discussion. It's up for discussion. It's happening. He will confirm a covenant with many. And in the middle of the seven, in the one, middle of one seven, in the middle of the one seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. The Jews will be doing their sacrifice and their offerings in our future. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation, just like Antiochus Epiphanes did by setting up that image, that pagan image of Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem and causing pigs to be sacrificed on the altar and the priest to drink blood and all of that. He will set up in a wing of the temple an abomination that desolates the temple until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. That's a simple way of saying he's really going to get his. Now, if you want to turn there, because again, a lot of, a lot of fanning the pages, but I recommended Revelation 13. We've read this before. By the way, we're going to read it again, but not today. But Revelation 13, verse 1. John, on Patmos, somewhere around 90-91 A.D., is writing this down, this vision that God gave him. And if you understand Daniel and what we just read, suddenly this makes all the sense in the world. For some of you, this is recap because we covered this before. But here's John's vision. And I saw a, a beast. We just read about a beast. Big iron teeth and claws and all of that. And, and the beast had ten horns and a little horn comes up and did, you know, uproots three of the other horns and takes its place and it's got eyes and it speaks vocally and horribly against God and all the things of God. The Antichrist. And now when John sees a beast, you've got to reckon that back to Daniel. It's not separate from Daniel it's not randomly put in there. Daniel is all over the book of Revelation. Which is where we're going when we finish Daniel. The beast I saw, I saw the beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns. We just saw that. Seven heads. We just saw that. Ten crowns on his horns. And on each head a blasphemous name. Ten things of, that are not of God. And the beast, here he is again. How many times that he says beast in here? It's incredible. It's all from Daniel. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, which was one of the visions he saw, but had the feet of those of a bear, which was another beast that he saw, and the mouth like that of a lion, which was another beast that he saw. The beast. It's a conglomeration of the empires of the world. And it's led by the little horn. And the dragon. That's the devil. Of course, I'm not making that up because the book of Revelation, John tells us specifically, the dragon is the devil. It's a type. And he tells us who it is so we don't miss the point. The dragon gave the beast, the Antichrist in his empire, his power. He gives Satan, gives the Antichrist, gives the Antichrist's empire, his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound. This is something that Daniel doesn't tell us. But it appears that the Antichrist becomes a lot like Jesus Christ to fool people. You remember Antichrist, anti-A-N-T-I, in the Greek is the same word as A-N-T-E. It's not just opposite. It can be so similar too you can't tell the difference. Like those of you who have ever, sorry, played poker and you have to ante up. Somebody puts in a, a dime or a chip or something and you have to ante up. You put in the same one if you want to play the game. And he has a resemblance to Jesus in that one of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound. But the fatal wound had been healed and the whole world was astonished and followed the beast. It was like a fatal wound and he comes back like a death and a resurrection. Like Jesus. He's like Jesus. Maybe this is Jesus, they would say. And maybe, maybe Jesus is in him and working with him. And that way he can dupe all the religious people that are left in the world at that time. 
And then men, verse 4, men worshipped the dragon, Satan, because he had, been, he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast, the Antichrist, and asked, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? He's the most powerful thing the world's ever seen. He's got the world in his hand, as it were. He really doesn't. But Satan, Satan has given him the power, and the Antichrist, through what he does, which is detailed out in fine detail in the book of Revelation, manages to dupe the world into worshiping Satan. Well, verse 5 back in Revelation 13. The beast, there it is again, beast, 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 was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies. There it is back in Daniel chapter 11. Exalt and magnify himself above every god and say unheard of things against the god of gods. And he will be successful until the time of wrath has been completed. is completed. The beast was given the mouth to utter proud words in Revelation and blasphemies to exercise his authority for 42 months. He's going to win. He's going to be successful. He's going to persecute the Jews horribly. And he opened his mouth to blaspheme God and slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. And he was given power to make war against the saints. Those saints are the Jews. Context Context, context. Those are the Jews. And conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Leadership is defined not by just as one who leads, but one who has influence. So even though the world in that short time will not be utterly united, as you'll see in just a few minutes, because it won't be, It'll be still fractured and disjointed, but he will be the most influential person in this world that the world has ever seen. You say, well, that's Jesus. No, it's really not. The world needs Jesus. Do you know who the most widely known person in the world really is? Abraham. Because he is the father of the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. They all know Abraham. This guy is going to be known by a lot more. Verse 8. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. They're going to worship him, everybody. They're going to be so duped by him. He's like Jesus, and he's the Jesus we like. We don't like the one that everybody talked about and that bloody corpse on a cross that we see in churches and all of that. Ah, we're going to worship this guy because he died, he came back to life. He's giving us what we want. He's successful, he's powerful, he's influential. And all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world, they will worship the Antichrist. Back to verse 36 in Daniel chapter 12. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify his name above every god. He will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. For what has been determined must take place. Listen, they will be successful until the time is completed. You know what that tells us about the Antichrist and Satan? God keeps them on a short leash. You see, if Satan runs rampant... It's only because God lets him. If the Antichrist rules the world, it's only because God lets him. And there are limitations. Satan gives his throne, his authority, his power to the Antichrist, who resembles Antiochus Epiphanes in many ways. And when he does, you got to remember that Satan is limited. As I've said so many times, I will say it again. That God is infinitely, infinitely Infinitely, underline italics, highlight infinitely, greater than the sum total of his creation, of which Lucifer, Satan, is just one little part of. He is infinitely greater. If Satan seems rampant, it's because of what you hear in Romans chapter 1. Man rebelled, God said, all right, have it your way. And he allows the devil to do some pretty fiendish things. But he also holds him back. Because if the devil were to allow to do everything that he wanted to do, I wonder what the world would look like now. 
God keeps him on a short leash. And the interesting thing is, when you think about it, that both Satan and the Antichrist are, I, 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 this is not the right word, but just let me use it anyway, sort of unwittingly accomplishing God's tasks at the end of the world. It's only God that unleashes him. It's only God that lets him loose to do what they want to do. It's only God that allows it. And that means that there are borders. What those borders are, he extends them much further out. But they still exist to accomplish God's purpose. God is never out of control. Ever. No matter what's going on in the world. No matter what's going on in Washington. No matter what's going on in our lives. No matter what's going on in the governor's mansion. No matter what's going on in your family or among your friends or any place else. No matter what's going on, God has not lost control. He is most surely in control. He's working the character of his son who suffered more than you ever will, and I ever will, into our lives. As the sufferings of Christ pour into our lives, so the comfort of Christ through our lives to others overflows. Are you suffering right now? He's making you into a missionary to other sufferers. He's tasking you. The comfort that you receive from God, maybe it's not today or tomorrow or next year, but it's coming. That's for you now to say, I know what you're going through. Let me pray for you. Let me put my arm around you. Or you will know, because God told you, that I really understand what you're feeling and what you're going through. God makes us comforters to each other. And that's perfect. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. You belong to Him. He dwells in you. And the Holy Spirit was first and foremost in the New Testament known as the Comforter. Also known as the counselor. I hate the suffering that I've been through in my life. By golly, I'm not done yet, neither are you. But I can tell you that all that suffering that I hated, all the regrets that Satan beats me over the head with, all the things that have ever occurred to me by the hand of others or even by my own foolishness have been a comfort to others. It's extraordinary. And it's like, how do you thank God for all of that? God will say, watch what I do with it. Just watch what I do with it. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not this year or next. But watch what I do with this. And I look back and I say, you know, I hate all of those experiences in my life. But now I wouldn't trade them for anything. Because I've seen the good that they do. Hmm. Well, God is in control. And he's in control of the Antichrist when he comes. He's in control of Satan when he comes. And right now, whether you believe it or not, he is in control of every earthly ruler and politician. Look at verse 37. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Okay, here's a very interesting passage. What's this have to do with anything? Just more of the description. Well, first of all, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the, uh, the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god. Well, what's the deal with this? He tosses aside religion. He may come across as a religious person. One of the things that got Adolf Hitler so much popularity among the German people is that he said, I'm a Lutheran. Oh, he's on the team. I guess we should listen to him. I guess we should do what he does. The man was a devil. Worse. But he got people's attention by declaring his fealty to the Lutheran church. Same thing about almost every president that's ever had a photo taken of him. That you will see every president that had a photo taken of him on Sunday mornings going in and out of church with the biggest Bible they can possibly carry. Because they know their voting base is largely Christian. Carry the Bible. Judeo-Christian. And the Muslims respect the Bible to a large extent, believe it or not. They're, they're not saved. They need Jesus. But they hold the Bible as a holy book. They still do. 
And they look at that and they go, okay, this is a great guy. I could vote for him. Kai, because he's on the team. This guy has some sort of a religious background. And we find that, once again, in great detail in the book of Revelation. But he uses religion as a tool, which is what most adept, I'm not going to say good, politicians will do. It's sort of to enrapture their audience and get more votes. Or if it happens to be in a more totalitarian society, to say that what I'm doing is of God. Let me do it. But he tosses away his own religious heritage in this, whatever the gods of his fathers were. Now some people think that, well, that makes him a Jew. No, it's the gods of his fathers. So that makes him something else. And, you know, though it's thought that he might be Jewish in origin, there's no way to really prove that. Could it be? Sure it could. Why not? But it treats him as if he's a pagan, and it equates him as if he's, well, a Greco-Roman. And that happens to be in the other prophecies of Daniel, like Rome. But he introduces his religion as a tool, as a scheme to unite the world for his own diabolical intentions. When you get to the book of Revelation, yeah, I'm spilling the beans because if we teach it, it's going to be a long time getting through it, but you know we're going to cover this again in greater detail. That when you read about the Antichrist's religious system laid in the book, you find that as you kind of peruse it, you're going, I think I see what's going on here. That he has a religious system, and the religious system is worship whatever you want as long as you worship me, which the Jews will not do. They might think of him as a Messiah at first, but when he tips his hand by setting up that abominable image in the temple in the future, like Antiochus Epiphanes, that's when Jesus told the Jewish people, head for the hills, get out while there's still time, because all living hell is going to break loose on this earth now go but he uses religion to unite the people and his religion is this believe whatever you want as long as you worship me that's the old caesar worship roman religion that you find in history remember when rome conquered it conquered vast portions of the world but it didn't turn all these different provinces and areas that they conquered into romans it just brought them into the empire. And all these different tribes and peoples and whatever, they could worship whoever or whatever they wanted to, as long as they also worship Caesar once a year. That was a way of uniting the empire. There was one God in common, and that was everywhere. They just set up temples to, to Caesar all over the place. Of course, the Jews wouldn't do it. And the Jews were such a problem to the Romans and before that the Greeks, Maccabean revolt and all, they knew how dangerous it could be to upset them. Don't upset them. They're a small people, but they are really, really zealous. So they gave them a pass. They didn't have to worship the emperor. But when the Christians come along, we suddenly realize that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And since Jesus is God... Well, we worship Jesus, second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God manifested in three different personages. We don't know how that works, just the way the Bible portrays it. Rome got word of this finally, and they said, well, if they can worship two gods, they can worship three. And now the Christians are bound to worship Caesar, and they won't do it. This is what got them persecuted, their refusal to worship Caesar. There were other details too, but that was the big one. The Antichrist is going to repeat this. He's going to say, worship whatever you want, as long as it's not God and his law. Those are the Jews. Worship whatever you want, but you got to worship me too. And the Jews aren't going to do that. Anybody that becomes a Christian during the last seven years of earth's history, they're not going to do it you got a problem, because he'll say at first he'll persecute you, he'll starve you out. And when that doesn't work, you'll kill him. And that's detailed out in the book of Revelation in some horrendous ways. It's interesting. Believe whatever you want. Worship whoever you want. It's all okay. 
as long as it's not Jesus, as long as it's not God. That's what the Antichrist pulls on the, on the world. Do that. How many times have you heard celebrities spout the drivel, and that's putting it kindly, that it doesn't matter what you believe so long as you are sincere? Or that God is your opinion. Well, does that make him true? No, when you die, your opinion dies with you. So what does that make God? A figment of your imagination and a manufacturer of your imagination. It's all, but see, we don't think that deep anymore. We're not taught to think. Weigh these things. When somebody says, all religions are the same, you know what that says? They don't understand any religions at all. They don't even know what's out there. Because all the religions of the world are radically different than each other. Radically different on how they, they function. Radically different on how they worship. Radically different on their ethics, on their morality, on life and death, heaven and hell, salvation. Anybody that's ever said all religions are basically the same doesn't know anything. And what's worse... And consider this, that the Antichrist will propose, as is being proposed in our country, in many countries of the world, and Europe has really grabbed onto this, a subjective religion. Something that is called your truth. This is your truth. This is my truth. Your truth, my truth, is going to die with you, with me, when we die. Does that make it true? It doesn't, because it doesn't last. It's not outside the system. It's completely subjective. And that means that your truth is a manufacture of your own life, of your own thinking, of my own thinking. And this is what the Antichrist ends up doing. You'll hear this message again when we get to the end of the book of Revelation. But it's fascinating how, listen to me, this is so important, how a personalized religion, right? A subjective religion, a subjective spirituality here at the end times will lead the world straight into Satan worship. That's what it says. It says it in Revelation. It says it here. The Antichrist's system of worship Whatever you want to worship, fine, as long as you worship me. But your truth is your truth. Pursue it. And ultimately it ends up with the devil being worshipped by the population of the world. Subjective religion leads to satanic worship in the end. That's where it's going. That's why it's such a lie. That's why it's so foolish. And it piles upon people who just want to be lazy in their thinking. God gave you a brain. The simplest people in the world could understand there are differences here. And when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and, well, some people will come before... No, it doesn't say that. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the world says, don't be so exclusive. I can't help it. Jesus was exclusive. Him or nothing. Amen. His salvation or no salvation. That's it. Jews, Gentiles, Christians, everybody. That's the road. And it's narrow. But he didn't make it hard. He just made it unpopular with my flesh. As for the beast, here in Daniel 37, he'll rely on the power of Satan. You find that over in Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, if you want to look it up on your own. He'll rely on Satan's power to accomplish his plans, including, just like Satan, the demand and the eventual ultimatum that everyone worship him. Just like Satan. Satan fell because he wanted to receive worship. And God said, no. 
And that was that. And then the devil became the devil. This man, just like the devil, says, Worship me, and all will go well with you. Remember, this devil tempted Jesus. Showed him all the kingdoms of the world. That was a miracle. How he did it, I don't know, but he did it. And he said, I'll give you all of these if you just bow down and worship me. <laughs> Jesus came back with scripture and blew him away. He said, worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Period. End of subject. But that will get you in trouble. The Antichrist knows it and takes full advantage of it. And then it says here, of course, in verse 37, that he will, I've got to find my spot here, sorry, um, that he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Uh, no regard for the one desired by women. Uh, please understand that this is not a statement that says that the Antichrist will be a homosexual. Could he? Sure, why not? But it doesn't say that here. It says that the Antichrist will have no regard for the one desired by women. What is that all about? It's quite simple. That from the time the Jews began to realize because of God's revelations to them that there is someone coming who is known as the Messiah, the anointed one, who will bring salvation to the world and will eventually rule the world, that it has been the joyful thought of every woman to be the mother of that person. This is one of the reasons why when you look around, once again, a little history background here, it's just real quick, but at the time of Jesus and before, because it coincides with something we talked about earlier, please forgive me if you weren't here to hear it, that Daniel chapter 9 indicates when Jesus was going to show up on the scene as a Messiah, as the Messiah. That around that time, people could do their math. And the women even knew, who weren't taught letters or numbers in those days, that the Messiah is going to show up pretty soon. Uh, he's going to be born. Wow. Hmm. I want to be the mom of the Messiah. And that's why during those days that about half the kids in Israel were named Joshua. Because Joshua in Hebrew is Yeshua. And Yeshua in Greek is Jesus. And of course, Joseph, Mary's husband, Jesus' stepdad, as it were, was told, don't be afraid, name him Jesus. Name him Yeshua, because he's the fulfillment. The kids were named Joshua. Again, God is salvation, and this is what they knew. God will save, and it's going to be through the Messiah. So he has no regard for the one desired by women. He rejects the Messiah outright. And I want you to, we're going to finish with this today, and we'll, and we'll keep going on this whole subject next week. That in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, and you can turn there if you like, we'll finish with this. This, John says, is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. How do you know that God is working? How do you know that in a pagan society or even in a, in a pluralistic society that this is really of God? Every spirit, he said, that acknowledges that Jesus Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, has come in the flesh. In other words, God has come in the flesh. God is salvation. Has come in the flesh is from God. That's pretty simple. How do you sort it all out? God came in the flesh? That spirit's from God. We won't go into all of that, but there it is. But in verse 3, John then says, But every spirit that does not acknowledge that Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. This is John writing his letter. He knows all about it. He knows the name. He knows the term. The Antichrist is coming. And, as he put it, is even now already in the world. The Antichrist? No. The spirit of Antichrist. 
Spirit of Antichrist is that which infects the world. It is a spiritual battle. It's from the enemy. It's from the devil. But it's that which tells people that Jesus was a good moral teacher, a really great guy. But he's not the Messiah. It's also the same spirit that has told so many of the Jewish people who are God's covenanted people, a people precious to him, a people that he will never go back on and never turn his back on. But so many of them have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And that doesn't come from God. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Because during those times, the Antichrist's war, as we're going to see next week as we take this further, is going to be not only against the Jews, but against any Christians that might be around at that time. And there won't be many. Well, there will be, but not like today. And his mission is to convince the Jews, don't turn to Jesus. His mission is to destroy anyone with the gospel because they are trying to turn people to Jesus. The spiritual war for men's souls, the souls of humanity, boils to the surface in a rage like never before during those last seven years of earth history when the Antichrist is going to be allowed by God to rule and reign. <laughs> Somebody who watches on YouTube, hi, said that I'm the master of cliffhangers. Will you get another one right now? Because we're going to now pick it up from there and carry this through next Sunday morning. And you want to be here for it because it just gets more and more interesting. Father, Thank you for loving us so much, having so much grace and mercy on us that you who knows the end from the beginning, and nothing, none of this is news to you. This is something that you've already been there and already seen and you're reporting to us, Lord. You tell us these things so that we will not be alarmed. You tell your people, the Jews, Lord, these things so that they will know that you have not left them or abandoned them. And above all, you have told us these things so that we don't make the mistake of thinking Jesus is someone other than who he is. That he is King of kings and Lord of lords and is coming back to take this world as his own, to destroy the Antichrist and all his works, to bottle up Satan for a thousand years and then condemn him to the lake of fire. Lord, Thank you for telling us. And through these things, like for your people, the Jews, help us to remember these things. For you are refining us. You are making us pure. You are making us spotless as we remember. You're coming. You will allow these things to happen. We must be ready. And you've given us the grace to know how. Thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.